Good morning, NCC Online. Thanks for showing up again today. My name is Pastor Rob. As always, great to be with you, whether you're listening at home uh, or maybe it's on your phone somewhere or wherever it is. Uh, just, just glad to be with you, connecting at least our hearts and our spirits. And uh, I, I want to start our service right off with a word of prayer today. Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you for each person tuned in. May you have a word for them in the scripture today. Uh, we pray that you would use me for that uh, purpose in a humble way, and I pray that you would lift up each person, whatever they're going through, whether it's just uh, cabin fever, or whether it's depression, or whether it's worry or anxiety, or what ifs about the future, or maybe things are going well, but either way, Lord, that you would be present and you would be loving each one tuned in today. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of things to know before we start, especially if you're part of NCC but you're just not able to come in right now. We are signing up for groups Sunday today, and we're doing that not only in person, but you can do it very easily virtually. Go to the website, as usual, newcommunity.church, and look for the group signups. Not hard to do at all. Uh, I understand if, if you're just not ready to be in a group right now, but groups are just a big part of our community. It's how we connect. It's how we grow spiritually, and it's just a way to make friends, so we want to keep our groups moving along. I also want to let you know we are doing another 516, and uh, God had put it, an opportunity to, to serve our neighbors, to have local compassion for uh, MACU, Mid-Atlantic Christian University. Of course, you, you've heard that their roof collapsed in their main building, their main classroom, but also where their food is served, and so they've been asking local churches to help with the food. We're going to do a food drive and try to get care packages with a lot of food into the hands of these students so that they can have uh, sort of nourishment and, and a pick-me-up as they study and, and try to, to learn about uh, God and their Christian university. So look at Facebook. There's a post there that gives you all the information. Even if you're not ready to come back in church yet, don't worry, there's a touchless way to still bring in and, and be part of that drive, so check that out as well. Today we're continuing our series, Stories You Didn't Hear in Sunday School. Now we said last week, and, and if you didn't hear last week, please go back and listen to that message about Rahab, really powerful and hopefully encouraging message about someone that God used, taking a bad reputation and moving it into good. Story you probably didn't hear in Sunday school because of her bad reputation, because of what she used to be. And yet some of these stories are the most powerful and profound. Uh, you hear, heard about the stories of David and Goliath. You, you know about the story of Samson and what he did. You probably heard the story of Noah and the flood and Jonah and the ark, uh, Abraham and Sarah and, and all these wonderful people. But you probably haven't heard of a guy named Shamgar unless you've been in church like a long, long time, then maybe you have, because this is a pretty obscure reference. This man named Shamgar was someone that God used, and that's who I want to talk about today. Last week, I read the passage about Rahab, and it was a long passage and told a pretty lengthy story. She got a lot of sort of face time in the Bible, and not only in the Old Testament, we, then we find out that twice in the New Testament, she's referred back to as a person of momentous faith. In fact, she makes the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11, which I, I think is fantastic because of what she did and how she believed in God. But this person only gets one, really one verse. Uh, so I'm going to read that whole passage too, but it's going to take me a, a very less amount of time. Judges 3.31 says, After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat. He too saved Israel. Shamgar, who dat? I mean, who is this guy? What do we know about him? Who's Anath? We never heard of him, his father. I don't know. He's a nobody. He doesn't have any military skills. He's using a, a farmer's tool. He's a farmer. He's a rural guy that just happened to be the right place at the right time. God used him. And it tells me something very profound, this sort of throwaway verse that you might read right over and not think anything about it. It tells me that God will take nobodies and use them as somebodies for his purposes. God will take nobodies, which includes Shamgar, but also includes you and me today, and make us into somebodies, that is, people that he wants to use. Little by little, bit by bit, equipping us, helping us, growing us, making us more like Christ for his purposes. 
that which he put us on earth for. And that is such a powerful message. I hope you lean in today. Now, you might be thinking already, Rob, I, I've heard that message before. You may have literally heard a sermon on this. And I know I've heard at least five sermons on this be- before. And I get that. You, may, you know, that, that, what does that really have to do with me? I think the problem isn't that we don't know that statement, but it's the application of it. And I really want to get into the practical. I want to give you three practical steps that Shamgar did, that you and I should do. Maybe you've taken a couple of these steps already. Maybe you haven't. Maybe your first is, like we talked about last week, is simply to put your faith and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's your first step. Pray right now. Lord, come into my life. Take over. Confess your sins to him. Let him fill you with his Holy Spirit and follow Jesus. That's, that's the biggest step. And these three steps really follow in terms of allowing God to use you in a practical way. So if that's you, buckle up because I want you to really lean in. Pay attention this morning and feel free to share this sermon too later with someone that you think would appreciate it. So what are those three steps? Firstly, believe that God can use you. That's so important. That's so primary. Believe that God can use you. At some level, Shamgar, this sort of nobody who ends up in the story of the judges, becomes one of the champions of God that's listed there with none other than the greats like Gideon and Samson and Deborah. He's right there in this story of who God would use to save Israel. And that's exactly what he does. So he had to believe it imperfectly, probably with lots of doubts, probably like us with lots of insecurities, but he had to believe it. He believed that God would use him, even though he really was a nobody that had no special skills. Uh, he, he didn't come from a prestigious family. If he had, we would most likely read about them. When we hear the name Anath, it just doesn't mean anything to us. He, he doesn't have any uh, military training. This is a, a farmer using a farmer's weapon, as we'll talk about a little bit more. He, he doesn't have any special wealth. He, he doesn't have a, some great inheritance. He, he doesn't have a, a college education or any kind of great intellect. This is a person that God used anyways. And you have to believe when starting into the conversation that God can use you. I think a lot of times you hear a sermon like this and you're thinking about somebody else. Yeah, God can use him. God could use her. I mean, she's so qualified, and skilled, and gifted. And he's so great at doing this and speaking and, and serving. And, but not me. Or as we've talked about many times, my past trips me up. You don't know what I've done. Well, as you're going to see in this sermon, there's a lot of people that God knew exactly what they had done and used them anyways, just like Rahab last week and just like you and just like me. We got to get over this first hurdle before we can go to steps two and three. And think about yourself. Do you really believe that God can use you in a significant, powerful way? More than that, that he made you with a purpose on this earth. And he's he's given you everything you need to have that purpose in his eyes, to do his work, to to lead out of what he's given you. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27, we read this verse, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Now, that verse is in Corinthians, which is a letter to Corinth that Paul writes. Paul the Apostle wrote a lot of the New Testament. He writes this letter, and most of the epistles are named after the city and really the church that he's writing to. And he's writing to this church in Corinth. And what you need to know is this church is a mess. You read through verse in 2 Corinthians, like this this church is out of their minds. They they are sinful. They're, They're baby Christians. They're newbie Christians. They're getting so much wrong. Paul's having to correct them, and, you know, it's like herding cats with the Corinthians. So when he says this to them, it's significant. First, it shows he hasn't given up on them. I I don't know. I think I would have, but Paul doesn't. Of course, God doesn't give up on them. God doesn't give up on us, and and that's so cool. But what he says is that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Now, that term foolish things, now here in the NIV, they're probably being kind Maybe a little bit of a euphemism because the original word is is a little harsher. The Greek word there is moros. It's the word where we get moron. It's the word that means moronic. That's the word. It's it's foolish things, yes, but it's harsh. Uh, From Strong's Concordance, 
That word means properly dull, insipid, flat, without an edge, mentally inert, dull in understanding, nonsensical, moronic, lacking a grip on reality, acting as though brainless. Paul, take it easy. That's harsh on your local church here that that you're helping to form. But he didn't hold back. And he's not trying to put them down by calling them brainless. He's trying to let them know and encourage them. He's trying to let them know, you know what? You guys, you may have a lot of problems. You may not be doing everything right. Uh, In fact, God is going to use you even though you're foolish and brainless. He's going to use you to shame those who think that they have all the intellect in the world which back then in the Greek culture was a big deal to be intellectually strong or to have a philosophy. Then he goes further. He says not only brainless, but he says weak. God will use the weak to shame those who are strong. Now that word is also a little bit more than what lets on in that translation. Weak in Strong's Concordance means without adequate strength, feeble, sickly, frail, and without necessary resources. Yikes. I mean, I don't know. That doesn't sound good. I don't want to be known as feeble, frail, without resources. This is, you know, this sounds terrible. But that's what he says. He's trying to give the church perspective. So they say, you're feeble. Without Christ, without God, really, if you're honest, you have nothing. And that's true for us today. And we know that we are without resources. We're brainless and feeble. Ah, okay. Ugh, sounds harsh, but... Wait, there's more because we will be used by God. That's the point. We will be used by God. Such an encouragement if you're feeling weak right now. I know I often do. I I feel like I don't have enough energy some days to make it through. I I feel like I don't have the power to do what God wants me to do. Uh, And in some ways that's true if I'm relying on myself. But God says, wait, I have a special place and a plan for you. You remember King David? Now, there's a, there's a great Sunday school story, really, before he was David, when he was the little shepherd boy that God used to slay Goliath, the, this monster of a person who was one of the Philistines, the same Philistines that Shamgar uh, is attacking, these, this ruthless enemy of God's people who are slaughtering them and really just using Israel as their sort of whipping, whipping boy and uh, abusing them and, and just complete godless people. God used David not because he was strong, not because he was older, not because he was trained. In fact, he was none of those things. He was the opposite of those things. He couldn't even fit into the armor they wanted him to wear, if you want remember that story. He just had a slingshot similar to Shamgar. He just had what he had. And that's who God used. He used David. Now, when you read his exploits later, you're like, of course, this is the champion. But that's only because God decided to make him the champion. It's not because he was so great. Rahab, last week, we talked about her past. We talked about her occupation. We talked about how she was a woman of the night, and she was used and abused, and most of her life had not gone as planned. But then one day, she took a step of faith, and God used that in a powerful, miraculous way, transformed her life, gave her a new reputation, put her on the path, gave her all kinds of blessings as we talked about. And ultimately, she becomes a direct link to Jesus Christ himself, ancest- ancestry speaking. And that's what God did there. Now, my own life has been marked by this. I- I've often felt that I, I just have no uh, reason to be a pastor. I-, I have no reason to lead even a small group. You know, I- I- I'm a nobody plucked from obscurity to do some small purpose on earth. And I believe that that's true of all of God's people. But God has used me anyways, and I'm just so grateful for that. One story about that, when I was at my former church, I was there for many years, and I first started as youth pastor, eventually switched over to young adult pastor, and just over the whole next-gen department. And when I switched to young adult pastor, it wasn't because I didn't want to work with teens. I did, but I, I had this sort of burden on my heart at the time because we were finding out that millennials, the generation of younger adults were just walking away from faith. They were walking away from church. They were walking away from Jesus. And we wanted to really do something about it. And and at the time, our our young adult program had been in a lull in between leaders and so on. And uh, God had just put that on my heart that I need to transition into that. But who was I to do that? 
uh, I, I didn't have any special gifts. I, I wasn't that sort of guy that would lead millennials, you know. I was already outside of that age group. But I felt like that's what God wanted, and so uh, the church agreed and put me on a path to do that. The first thing I did was take a trip across the country to visit major young adult ministries and churches that were doing this really well. I wanted to see what do the big guys do. That was my simple idea. I was like, well, and the church let me do that, and they paid for this trip, and I went to all these churches across the nation. And I went to these churches, and I visited their groups, and I talked to their leaders. And you know what? It was harsh because the leaders were blunt with me. They did not see me, for the most part, as someone who should be leading millennials. They let me know that. Some of them were very direct. You're too old. You don't have the skills. You're not a good enough speaker. You're not hip and cool. They didn't use those words, but that's what they were telling me. Your, your genes aren't skinny enough. You, you, you don't have charisma. You don't have, you're not that guy. You, you just don't have the it factor. Uh, and, and you know what? They were right, and I knew they were right. I didn't have any of those things. I didn't have any special reason to lead millennials. I didn't have anything to draw them to who I was. Of course, I knew, too, that that wasn't the point. I, I knew as a pastor, my, my reason was always to point people to Christ, not to point them to myself. And I, I knew these people meant well, too. They were probably trying to warn me so I didn't just sort of crash and burn. I, I'm sure they meant well. But when I came back from that trip, I'll be honest with you, I was discouraged. I, I had self-doubt. I, I was wondering, Lord, is, did you really put this in my heart? Is this something I wanted to do? Because they're right. I, I don't, I'm not that person. I don't, I, I don't have that sort of cool factor, you know? And no one would debate that. I was too old. I, I didn't have all the skill set needed to, to lead this, to get millennials back into churches. I wasn't going to do that. Still, by the grace of God, I had just enough faith to keep moving forward. And so we did. And when we first started our, our weekly, or restarted our weekly ministry, the first week uh, we met on Tuesday nights, the first week we had 14 people show up. That's it. And that included me, the core team, and the band. Okay, just to give you an idea. 14 people. But that was week one. And we plowed through. And would you know, before a year was up, we had over 100 young adults worshiping Jesus Christ every single Tuesday night. Well over 100 people gathering on a Tuesday night, in addition to church, coming to hear God's word, to have communion and community with each other, and, and worshiping full throttle. I remember sometimes just sitting in the back of the room while worship was going on, just so impressed by God, seeing hands raised and voices lifted of millennials, who at the time everybody had sort of given up on. And I'll share that as a boast to myself. I didn't do anything. That's the point. I wasn't worthy. I wasn't skilled. I wasn't gifted. I, I didn't have the charisma. But God used even me, and he'll use you too. You have to believe it. Believe that before you go anywhere else. But it, once you do, step number two, use what God has given you. Shamgar, in this one little verse in the Bible, only had one tool. Now, we don't know what else he had. We don't, God doesn't give us that, and maybe that's the point. He only says he used an ox goad. I mean, really? That's what you did? Let me read the verse again because it's so short. Judges 3.31, after Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines, these enemies of God's people, with an ox goad, he too saved Israel. Not a military weapon, simple farming weapon. Think of an ox goad as a cattle prod, essentially. Now, this week when I was, last week when I was starting to prepare for this message, I texted all of our staff and I said, does anybody happen to have an ox goad that I can use for Sunday's sermon, next Sunday's sermon? And everyone was like, well, I'll check, but, you know, I'm pretty sure I don't have one. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I have one. Actually, no, everybody said they didn't have one. But next, someone said, we could make you one. And our crack staff team, so awesome, so dependable and ready to go. They did. They made us one, and I have it here. And this is, uh, this is the NCC ox goat. Now, this is a pretty good replica that Ricky, I believe, made. And you see that it's just a smaller scale. It would have been bigger, 
but in like a staff. So they might have used this as a staff because they weren't shepherds, they were farmers. But at the same time, they would have this piece here that was most likely in metal. And it would have been very, very strong, very, very durable. And they were very good uh, at making tools at this point in the history of Israel. And so this would have been an excellent tool, but it's a farming tool. And in many purposes, sometimes they might have the other end have a bit of a shovel end on it, so they could use that end as well. But this part is the cattle prod. And you could imagine just trying to get these giant beasts of burden going where they needed to go and just, you know, sort of hitting them because they had thick skin, and if you use your hand, it wouldn't do anything. So they would use these sort of cattle prods, and they call them ox goats. This is what he had. This is all Shamgar had. He used this ox goat to do God's work, to protect and defend his countrymen, to, to, to do God's will on the earth. And he did something extraordinary, 600 of these enemies, these Philistines. I mean, it's unbelievable. This is all he had. Now, I was thinking this would be a pretty good weapon for when the zombie apocalypse happens, because we all know from television that that's just a matter of time. And 2020, you know, if we're honest... It'd be a pretty good year. I'm thinking by maybe by November, we're going to have zombies the way things are going. And so you might want to get yourself an ox goat because this, this would be pretty good, I think, against, no, you don't, I, you're not feeling that? Okay, well, whatever. But that's your ox goat. And I think it represents Shamgar in his tool, not so much his ability. And that's what God says to you and me. Use what you have. I've called you. I brought you into my family through Christ, by his blood, by his sacrifice on the cross. I made you one of my children. But more than that, I've, from birth, given you a special purpose on earth. That's true for every human being. I don't care what weaknesses you think you have or that you actually have. So use the gifts that I've given you to do my will. And you probably already know what those are. I think most people do. Some people, I don't know what they are. Well, yeah, you probably do. Uh, and if you don't ask your best friends, they know what they are. They'll tell you very quickly, or, or a pastor, or uh, uh, someone who has some discernment. Uh, do you remember the TV show MacGyver growing up? Uh, at least if you're my age uh, or older, you remember. Not the new one. I, I, I guess there's a new one. Don't, that's trash. But I'm talking about the original MacGyver, you know, Richard Dean Anderson with the 80s hair and the skills that he had. The whole point of that show, of course, was each episode starting with the pilot, he would take what he had and use it in extraordinary ways to pull off the unbelievable. And that was the formula for the show. Every episode, the very first pilot episode, he used a paperclip. That, that, was, his, that was his ox code, <clears throat> if you will. MacGyver finds himself in a jam, which happened, again, every episode. He gets a paperclip, he bends it, and he uses it to short out a missile timer. And there's a picture of it. That's from the first episode. That sounds ridiculous. It was. It's 80s TV. But the point is he used what he had. Later in that same episode, he, takes, he makes a rocket thruster by hitting a flare gun with a rock. I'm not kidding. And that sends two people, himself and another man, launch off a mountain where he later re releases a parachute and makes a swift getaway. It, you know, they just don't make TV like this anymore. 80s television was great. It was the golden age of television. Not really, but I do miss some elements. Like, you could have a car get in a fender bender, and it would burst into flames automatic every time. You knew it was going to happen. Like in the TV show Chips, which we <laughs> used to be. MacGyver had a purpose. His purpose was to get people out of jams. He knew that. More than that, he often was left without resources, so he would scavenge and see, what do I have? I have my duct tape. I have my bent paper clip, maybe even a flare gun some episodes, and I'm going to use those for the purposes at hand. That's what, a, that's what God's trying to say to you today. That's the message of Shamgar. That's the message of a lot of the Bible. I mean, read it through. The big picture is real clear who God used. Why did he use them? It's almost like he's trying to make a point of who is most unusable and using them instead. That should give you and me great hope. In fact, I might go further to say, if you think you're very usable for God, you're probably not. 
The alternate is often true, and that's why Jesus said, you know, look, if you want to gain your life, you've got to lose it. You have to see this as a God perspective that, you know, I'm not all that. If you're someone who suffers maybe with pride or even narcissistic tendencies, say, you know, let me crucify myself in Christ because I died with him, and I'm not all that, and God is. And that's when we become most usable is when we acknowledge our weakness. Use what you have. Now, what do you have? Three things that every person has. Your skills, your gifts, and your passion. Every person has those three things. Automatic. So ask yourself this morning, what are my skills? Those are God-given. You probably had them innately at birth. Most skills that we have, God gives you before you're even born. Like David says, he, he framed me in my mother's womb. He knew everything about me. He set me on a path, and that's what he did for you and me. He gave you skills. Now, you spend a lifetime of discovering them and figuring them out and honing them and getting better at them, maybe taking some classes to gain knowledge or, or putting them into practice. What are your skills? Some people are good with their hands. Some people are good with computers. Some people are good with children. Some people are artistic. Some people are crafty. Some people can do all kinds of things. That's your skill set. That's important. That's something God gave you. Secondly, ask, what are my gifts? Now, here I'm talking about a spiritual gift. It's different than a skill set. Usually, the difference is skills come at birth. They're also a gift from God. But your spiritual gifts that the Bible talks all about, they come after you become a Christian because they're by the Holy Spirit. And these are things that directly benefit the church. They're always... They're always something that gives a direct benefit to the church, God's people, as we have communion. That's why it's so important, by the way, to eventually gather back together because he's given the gifts. If you read through the New Testament, every time he mentions these gifts, they're for the church. They're for the other people. They're for your small group. They're for other Christians. They're as we gather together, we use these gifts. And during the week, we use these gifts. Maybe your gift is that you can communicate well. Maybe you are able to share your faith easily. That's a gift that God talks about. Maybe you can understand Scripture in a way that other people can't. Many people find Scripture very difficult. You find it not hard. That's because God gave you a spiritual gift. Maybe you have discernment. That's a spiritual gift, being able to know good versus evil in, in, in difficult situations. You might actually find yourself frustrated when you're reading on online with all of the lack of discernment. That's probably because God gave you the spiritual gift of discernment. You may have the gift of leadership, also called administration in the Bible, where you find yourself often leading things. That's a, that's a spiritual gift, not just in the workplace, but in God's church, to humbly use that as a servant. Of course, in God's economy, it's never lording it over other people. It's always washing other people's feet. I put myself underneath people. If you're doing it as a top down, you're doing it wrong in the Bible. I lead people from below. I lift them up, and I become the first follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you have the special ability to have faith, another spiritual gift. This is when you can believe in things even without trying that hard, and that's a gift. That's, that's a spiritual gift. You may have the gift of generosity. That's usually about resources. It's often about what you own, and, and, and it's almost always tied to your money. God has given a special gift. We're all to be generous, but he's given a special gift to some unique individuals to give generously, especially for his purposes, his kingdom, to his church, to supposed to help out uh, the poor, the vulnerable, the, the ministries of the church. That might be your gift, and you know it. Maybe you love serving other people. Maybe you're very good at hospitality. I, I, I do not have the gift of hospitality as an introvert. As someone who is a little bit private, I try to be hospitable because that's a command, but I'm not that good at it. You may be able to do that very easily. And if you do, know that that's a huge gift. All of these are. Pray, Lord, what is the gift you've given me? Ask others. Put it into practice. I don't think you need to take any kind of test to find out your spiritual gift. I actually believe the Bible way to do it is by putting it into practice. As you put into practice these gifts, you're going to find out which ones God gave you and which ones he didn't. And if it comes hard and it's not, it doesn't feel right, then know that that's not your gift. If it comes very easily, even, even if it's hard sometimes, that is your gift. Use them for God's kingdom and for his church. And then thirdly, your passion. I believe that everybody has a God-given passion. What do you dream about? What do you love in this world? What gets you fired up? What gets you up in the morning? Or when you get up in the morning, what gets you out of bed? That's your passion. If, if you can't answer that right now, maybe that you've lost your passion. Pray for that. God, breathe. Breathe. 
give me a passion back for you, your people, your word, your purposes. Pray, Lord, give me a specific call right now in my life that you want me to do. Show me how to serve the other Christians. It may be very humble. It don't have to kill 600 Philistines, thank the Lord, to be used by God. You can be used by God in a very humble way by serving behind the scenes in kids' community. We're starting to open that back up by serving a, a, a family, by, by caring for their baby. I mean, what a precious gift that is for a family to take care of them, to nurture them, that you only have that gift. Uh, or to help out with teenagers who are going through difficult times of life and you have the ability to walk through that. Or teach the Bible and lead a small group. Or, or be on a hospitality team where I'm, I'm shaking hands and greeting people. These are some of the many teams you have right here. Or maybe it's something even bigger than that God's calling you to and you know it. Uh, and, and, and it's time to act on it in faith. And start with prayer. These are the gifts God has given you. Your skills, your gifts, your passions, and so many others. But start with those. When you add them together, that's your ox code. Your skills, your gifts, and your passions all together. That's your ox code, so to speak. That's what God has given you. And it's a huge arrow to why he put you on planet Earth. Once you know those three things, it's a huge pointer. You won't know his specific call. You won't know what exactly he wants you to do. But it'll be a huge arrow in that direction. And by the Holy Spirit, you can follow that arrow. And then thirdly, rely on the strength that God gives you. So important. Believe that he can use you. And that means in a very humble way, despite your weaknesses. Believe that he's given you everything you need to do your work on this earth. And do it in his strength. This may be the tough one because... Once we get going, it actually, because we're human, gets harder and harder to be humble, especially if God starts to let you flourish, especially when you're doing that young adult program and it goes from 14 to 130. And you start thinking, hmm, good job, you know, I did that. God used me, yes, but he used me. I'm the man. I'm the woman, whatever. (laughs) Not a good place to be. Because he'll let that work tumble pretty quick when you get in that pride phase. Don't let yourself go there. Realize that Shamgar did it in God's strength. Do you think he could do what he did, kill 600 enemies, 600 with a tool like this, if it weren't God's strength? Do you really think Shamgar did that in his own humanity? Do you think he's some kind of Rambo that he's coming around with, you know, some kind of, I don't know, Bible times machine gun? No, he didn't do that. He only did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that was true of all the judges, and you read that, and it's usually in the story that God's Spirit fell on them, came upon them. Shamgar's too short short of a story to even get that, but that was true of all the judges. The Holy Spirit came upon them. It was always in God's strength that he did or she did what they want, what God wanted them to do to save his people, to help them out of trouble, to get them out of a jam. And that's true for you and me too. Can you be a good parent without God's strength? No. Can you be a good husband without God's strength? Can you be a good wife without God's strength? Can you be a good employer without God's strength? Can you be a good worker without God's strength? Can you be a good student without God's strength? Can you be a good single person without God's strength? There's nothing you can do well without God's strength. You will try, you will get so far, and you will eventually crash and burn. But with the power of God, you have an unlimited ability on earth to do what God has asked you to do. Not everything limited to what God has asked you to do on earth, whether it be a, being a parent or a husband or a wife. And you think, well, I could never do what Shamgar did, though. I couldn't kill 600 of God's enemies and become a hero like that. That may be true, but that's not what God called you to do. He's called you for an even greater work. What Shamgar did was was great, but imagine the greatness that God has called you to do. Maybe your greatness is spiritual battle, which is even bigger than a physical battle. No matter what we may feel about physical battle, seems pretty exciting, spiritual battles are way more important. Your battle may be the battle for your own soul that each of us has, and Only by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
can we win that battle. It's really God who wins the battle. Your battle may be for your children's soul in a world gone wild that we're living in right now. And your, your job is to prayer, prayerfully protect them, is to each day lift them up in prayer and to defend them as much as you can and, and allow God really to defend them. He's the only one that can. It may be for the soul of your marriage. That's a way bigger battle that you have right now. And don't give up on it, despite how things look or how bad they get. God can give you the victory. It may be all kinds of battles I couldn't even know that you're fighting right now. Name that battle and realize that God will give you the strength. He's promised to give you the strength. He will use you. He has called you. He will get you through. And here's the secret. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. God, it's God's power, not ours. That really is the secret to success. That's, that's it. It's God's power, not, not ours. That verse says, but we have this treasure. It's talking about the treasure of God or even the gospel, the good news of Jesus. In jars of clay, it's talking about our physical bodies, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So true. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power, the strength that we have, unlimited resource that God gives for His work and His will and His gospel, is His, not ours. Now, this word jars of clay is so appropriate, of course, by the Spirit of God, inspired that we're like these clay pots, the ones that they had during the Bible times. Two things that we know about them right away. One, they were extremely fragile. Today, we have some technology that can make pots a little better. These, These are the pots they had in their homes that were constantly breaking. You would use these for some purpose. You'd maybe have it on top of your cooking area. You would put it in your kitchenette and it would fall and it would immediately shatter into all these pieces. They were breaking all the time. They probably had to make these and remake these all the time. So God is telling us, realize you're fragile. You are not all that. Your strength is extremely limited. But that's okay because my power dwells in you. And I will allow you to do what I want you to do if you'll trust in me. The second thing we know about these clay pots were that they were handmade. They were always handmade. They didn't have a fabrication process back then. They, they weren't machined or made in any other way other than by a potter's hand, one-on-one. So God is telling us that's true for you too. And whenever you feel like giving up or that you don't have a purpose or that God doesn't love you, remember that he is the potter and we are the clay, just like the Bible teaches. And he's literally molded you into the shape that he wanted. Yes, fragile, but also empowered so that he will get all the glory, because he's God. We are not. And so we are handmade by God. We are to be useful for his purposes. We get to know that he made us, and that's exciting. Now, I want to close with this list, because you probably, you probably heard these lists on the Internet. I've seen them on memes, and sometimes I just pass them by. But when you just slow down for a minute, of all the kinds of people that God used in the Bible, and just take a sample of that, this morning. Think about as we close. If you're not yet convinced that he wants to use you, that he has a plan for your life and that he will empower you to do it, think just for a second. Really think about who he used in the Bible. Noah, as we know, great man of God, really saved the planet (laughs) from God's wrath. He had a drinking problem. Abraham was way too old. Uh, He really didn't get going until he was 90. He had a baby when he was 100 to to start fulfilling God's purposes for your life. If you think you're too old, you're wrong. I'm guessing you're not 100 yet. Isaac was a dreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was, how can I say this tactfully? She was beauty challenged, the Bible tells us. Joseph was abused. Do you know God can use abused people from the worst backgrounds? Moses stuttered. Phenomenal story. 
the voice piece of God, the one who would go before Pharaoh, this near all powerful person, seemingly, and speak on behalf of God's people, he had a stuttering problem. It's true. Gideon was poor. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. We talked about her last week. Timothy was way too young. Yet Paul says, don't let anyone look down at you, Timothy, because you're young. And I would say that to anyone who feels they're too young listening in right now. God wants to use you now. He wants to use you for his purposes today. doesn't mean you still have time to go or rush into something. doesn't mean you shouldn't prepare. You should. But doesn't mean that you should be not serving either or waiting for some time when you're older. Elijah was suicidal. That's right. We have mental illness in the Bible. We have people in complete despair and depression. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Isaiah preached naked. Don't ask. I'm not talking about that one. Jonah ran away from God. Naomi was a widow. Job lost everything. John the Baptist ate bugs. What a weirdo. He was a weirdo. And yet he was the precursor of Christ himself. God used him in a powerful, powerful way. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about practically everything. The Samaritan woman at the well was divorced five times, and she was living with a guy, the sixth guy. And God used her in a powerful way to reach her entire community for Christ. They were saved through the Samaritan woman at the well. So beautiful. Zacchaeus was too short. I can relate. Timothy had medical problems. Paul was a terrorist. You may not think of Paul as that way. Hopefully you think about him as the great, other than Jesus, the greatest person in the Bible, wrote most of the New Testament, half of the New Testament, was the greatest missionary of of all times, launched the church by the Spirit of God. And yet, before he came to Christ, he was a terrorist. He was killing people because they were Christians. He was going from place to place to place, killing them. That's a terrorist of the worst kind. I'm glad God didn't cancel him. He had a plan for his life. He's got a plan for your life too. Lazarus was dead. I'll end with that one because what are you going to say? This man died, and in this unique case, God rose him back to life and used him some more because that's what God wanted to do. That's what God made him for. He made him so that he would rise to life. So we read about that in the Bible. If you're discouraged, you're down, you're not sure what your calling is, this is the day to clarify it. This is the day to cry out to God. He will show you. He's not trying to hide it from you. This is not a secret. It's just going to take you walking humbly with God by the power of the Spirit, dying to self, living in the Spirit, walking, keeping in step with the Spirit. He will show you and He will use you for His purposes. You know, the greatest thrill, I believe, in all of life is knowing what God made you for. It's a great gift. And then using it and seeing God use you and being amazed that God would do that. It's the greatest thrill in life, virtually the greatest thrill. And if you're not regularly sensing that thrill in life, this is the time to move into it. Life's too short not to have that. Trust me. Believe that God has made you for a purpose. Believe that he can use you no matter what your weakness. Stop comparing yourself to everybody else. Well, she has this, and I see him having this, and that person can do this, and I see all their stuff on Facebook and Instagram, and don't do that because God has uniquely given you everything you need, and then go in the strength that God has provided. That's it. That's the key. Let's do it today, church. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that you chose to use the nobodies, to become somebodies, to do your purposes. That's true for me. That's true for Shamgar. That's true for all of this list of Bible characters. It's true for every person who has ever followed you. May those who feel weak be lifted up and seen as strong in Christ. May those who feel strong acknowledge their weakness. And may you give a special call to someone listening into this video today. It's a special new call in their life, Lord, that You have a destiny for them that starts to get awakened even right now as I pray. Only you can do that by the power of your Holy Spirit. And for each of us in everyday ways to get into your church, Lord, at the right time without being vulnerable 
and serve each other wholly the best we can because that is what you want us to do. And give us your strength to do it. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you again, church. You're awesome. We love you. And we're praying for you. Uh, whether you're far away and you're just tuning into NCC, whether you're vulnerable and, and uh, please stay safe, uh, come back when you're able to. Uh, maybe uh, you're a parent and know that we're starting to get kids' community rolling, phasing that in, and that's so exciting for us. Uh, no matter what you are going through or where you're at, uh, we want to be with you in prayer. And if there's anything you need, dial into the church number, extension 4, for specific needs or practical needs or prayer requests. We, we would love to know about it. Have a great Sunday. And uh, don't forget to check out the 516 that we've put up on Facebook.